my own eyes and practiced with you know myself and so this is something inshallah hopefully which will be a benefit to, to people so that everybody understands that this is not a subject that inshallah is, is, is new to me but it's a subject that I've been very very interested in for a very long time and very active in for a very long time and alhamdulillah and it's something that I would encourage the brothers to learn more about, to get involved in those who are able as the messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said whoever is able to help your brother let him do so and I'll talk a little bit about the characteristics what kind of brothers are suitable for this kind of work what kind of characteristics do you need? And I'll take this from the advice of Shaykh Ali Hafidahullah when he advised me about the kind of characteristics you need to find in yourself if you want to get involved in this. And I'm here also not only to, to hopefully benefit you with some uh, information and some knowledge from the Book of Allah and the Sunnah of His Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and some of my experiences, but also to try to encourage brothers upon the Sunnah with a, with a sound aqidah following the sunnah of the Messenger of Allah وسلم, to get involved and to help other people because there is almost no limit to the number of Sahara, the number of magicians, the number of people who are involved in the, the worship of the shaitan, these people who are causing so much harm to the point that I say that there's rarely a family, rarely a family who have escaped this harm completely. And so it, there is a desperate need for people to learn this skill, to become involved in it to be able to advise people and at the minimum you know that you should be able to after this set of four or five lectures you should be able to advise your brothers and your sisters in Islam you should be able to at least give them some beneficial advice and you know subhanallah that's very rare these days and and you know subhanallah we talk a little bit about that later on I talked about my first case, I have had some very strange cases and inshallah maybe towards the end of the lecture even though it's not my purpose just to tell you stories but you know at some point I, I might be able to tell you one or two but one of the strangest ones that I ever had and uh, I hope, I ask Allah Azza that this won't happen in this particular gathering is that I was giving a lecture very similar to this one in a, in a city uh, north of here and uh, while I was giving it I decided that I was going to do a, uh, a live example of of Ruqya on somebody who had no problem whatsoever. So there was a brother, I'd agreed with him in the audience and I'd said to him, Akhi, you've got no price and no problem at all. See, so perfectly healthy, perfectly healthy. You know, no heart illnesses, no, you know, you're not going to collapse on me. He said, no, not at all. I said, I just want to show people how you perform the Ruqya. So I sat there and I recited on him and unfortunately one of the sisters, Qadr Allah wa ma who was in the audience had been afflicted by magic and she collapsed in the middle of the, of the lecture. So. Maybe today, inshallah, there won't be any live uh, examples. I've learned from my, uh, I've learned from my uh, experiences in that regard. What I've been asked to cover today, and I'm going to try to stick quite strictly to what I've asked, been asked to cover today because there are a number of other brothers, some of them are shy, who are going to, inshallah, be giving lectures and who have given lectures. So I don't want to overlap too much on what they have already spoken about but I will have to touch upon some things. The reason is that this kalam is, this, uh, this topic is, is musalsal. Uh, it's something which, it's, it's a series of topics that build upon each other. And so I'm not gonna jump right into the middle and start talking without just going over some of the introductory topics. But this is a good chance to ask you guys questions about what you've learned so far. And maybe we'll just go very, very briefly over things that the other speakers have touched upon. And uh, hopefully, inshallah, this will just reinforce and uh, further emphasize what you've already learned and what some of the speakers are going to speak about. What I've been asked to cover today, how to protect ourselves from the jinn, the difference between the evil eye and jealousy and protection from the evil eye and jealousy, types of possession, the signs of somebody who is possessed, the definition of ruqya and how it is practiced, and the halal and the haram of exorcism in Islam, what you should look out for, what you should not look out for, and I'm sure there'll be a few other things uh, thrown in there bi-ithnillahi tabaraka wa ta'ala. I also plan, if Allah Azza wa gives us the tawfiq, to leave plenty of time for questions because this is always a topic when there is no shortage of uh, questions amongst the brothers bi-ithnillahi tabaraka wa ta'ala. Very briefly before we start, as an introduction, and I always make this, I make a rule that whenever I talk about this topic, we get this thing locked down before we even begin. A word about the unseen. What we're going to talk about now, Ya Ikhwani, is from the matters of the unseen 
from the ilmul ghaib that nobody knows the complete nature of it except Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And be wary of those people who are able to answer every single question about this topic. And they seem to have an unlimited amount of knowledge about the jinn and about what the jinn do and about how sihr happens and about how... Alhamdulillah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given us what is enough for us and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given us in the book of Allah and in the sunnah of his messenger sallallahu what is enough for us in this topic. And there are going to be things in which I am going to hold my hands up and say, Allahu a'lam, Allah knows best. Because when you are dealing with the unseen, there are by nature, the only way you can know about this unseen is what has come from the book of Allah and the sunnah of the messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And I always question, and I talk a little bit about some of the YouTube videos that are going around these days, but I always question some brothers and they talk about aspects of this topic. And I say to them, Ya Akhwan, where have you got this knowledge from? If you didn't get it from the book of Allah and you didn't get it from the sunnah of the Prophet sallallahu where did you get this knowledge from? And I fear that some of the brothers unfortunately have collected pieces of knowledge from the Sahara, from the magicians and from the people who are involved in the istighatha bil jinn, seeking help from the jinn. And they unfortunately mix this and they mix it up with the book, and the, the book of Allah and the sunnah and they, you know, kind of give it out to the people. So don't be frightened and don't be shy in these topics to say Allahu A'lam because we have only been given a knowledge of this thing, only a small amount. And we only know about it what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has told us. And this is something which is, you know, which is very important. What I will say is there is room for experience in this topic. There is room for us to relate our experiences, for us to say that from my knowledge, as far as I know, this is true about the jinn, not because I found it in the Quran and not because I found it in the sunnah, but because I found it from my own experience. But I will try as best I possibly can to be very distinct between the things that are authentic from the book of Allah and the sunnah of the Prophet Sallallahu and the things that are my opinion or the things that I have picked up from my experience. And I think we should be very careful to distance ourselves between the two and differentiate between the two so that we don't mix up the wahi that there is no doubt in it whatsoever with the experimentation and the experience of brothers who make mistakes and they get some things right and they get some things wrong. So in this topic generally I advise you very strongly that when you hear the brothers and the mashayikh are telling you about this topic and the other brothers who are going to speak after me and those who have spoken before me differentiate between what is authentically proven in the book of Allah and the sunnah of his messenger sallallahu alayhi wasallam and that which is simply from our experience or from some of the experiences of our scholars or from some of the brothers who have uh, been involved in these things or whatever it may be. Those are valid and they're not wrong, but they are only experienced. They are open to criticism and they are possibly open to critique. So we say to people that distinguish between those two things, that's a word of warning uh, before we begin. The first topic that I was asked to speak about today is how do we protect ourselves from the jinn? I think to protect ourselves from the jinn, we must first learn who the jinn are and who they are not. And I think, inshallah, most of you will have covered this, inshallah, in the first uh, lecture that was given here at Green Lane, inshallah, ta'ala, on this topic. But I'm just going to ask a few questions and just make sure that everybody, we're all on the same page when it comes to the jinn and who they are. I want some brothers to give me some things that they've learned about the jinn, some characteristics of the jinn, uh, something that they've learned from the previous lectures uh, of the mashayikh regarding, regarding the jinn. Some, some brothers to contribute for us, inshallah. Just very, very quickly, this is not the point of the topic. This is just to get us into the point of the topic, inshallah. If you don't put your hand up, I'm going to pick on people. Bismillah. Created from a smokeless fire. Okay, question to everybody. Does that mean that now the jinn are fire? If I am involved in a jinn, if a jinn possesses me, do I get burnt? No. They were created from a smokeless fire like Bani Adam was created from clay. So like ben Bani Adam was created from clay and when I touch my hand, I don't get any clay on it. Likewise, the jinn were created from a smokeless fire and that fire remains a part of their nature. But we know from the hadith of the Prophet wasallam that they right now are not actual fire or something like that. Good. What else have we learned? Okay, they live amongst us, they have families, there are Muslim jinn, Buddhist jinn, Hindu jinn, there are good jinn, bad jinn, not every 
shaitan or not every jinn is a shaitan and not every shaitan is a jinn because we have shayateen from the humans and we have shayateen from the jinn and we have believers from the jinn and we have disbelievers from the jinn good most of them live they tend to live inhabit in faraway places places like deserted places or places where it's not particularly clean whereabouts in your house whereabouts would you be careful of in your house toilets bathrooms good excellent inshallah what else have we found out about we mentioned them being about the unseen who stays in the same place. Excellent. So we know that the jinn are of different types. We know there are three types defined in the sunnah. One that flies through the air and one that takes the form of snakes and dogs and one that, uh, and one that resides in a particular place, much like the humans reside in a particular place. Uh, we know that they are from the unseen. We know that they see us from where we do not see them. What else have we, we picked up from the lecture? Inshallah. As quickly as we can, inshallah, so we get onto the topic. Okay, we know that they can touch people and we know that they can possess people. Excellent. Good. We know that the jinn, we should be careful that everybody understands, and I'm sure the brothers have explained this already, that not every jinni is evil. And we should get away from the, this idea that all of the jinn are inherently evil and inherently bad. They do have certain characteristics though. What have we learned about the characteristics of the jinn? Their nature. Are they reasonable and very, you know, deliberative and very slow and, you know, or are they kind of fiery and very quick to, to do things? They have a very fiery character. Excellent. Okay, they have abilities that we don't have, but we need to be careful to understand these are not what we would call supernatural Abilities. These are just different to our abilities. Okay, the jinn can fly, but there are things that we can do that the jinn cannot do, and there are things that the jinn can do that we cannot do. What I'm getting, uh, what I'm getting at by this is that we should not attribute acts or characteristics of divinity, things that belong only to Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala, to the jinn, just because they can do some things that we can't do. The jinn can fly through the sky. Okay, planes can fly through the sky, but you don't see people worshiping planes. Okay, so it's very important that while we realize the jinn, yes, the jinn can fly, some of the jinn at least can fly through the sky, and they can do things quicker than us, and some of them have strength, and some of them, they're very, very different. But that doesn't mean that they should have any share in the divinity that belongs to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And this is where people have gone very badly wrong in the past. Because the jinn were able to do things that they were not from the normal things that human beings could do, people attributed divinity to them. People attributed to them the attributes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and people eventually uh, performed acts of worship towards them. So it's very, very, very important that when we talk about the jinn, we understand that they are simply different. And that's where I come onto the topic of fear of the jinn. And I just, you know, again, glimpse or you know, kind of skim over these topics, but fear of the jinn. Allah says, Don't fear them, but fear me if you are really believers. So it's not something to be feared. You know, I mean, I, I tell you honestly, I have, a, I have a fear of wasps. Okay? And I don't have a, alhamdulillah, I, I can honestly say, alhamdulillah, bi ni'matin min Allahi wa fadl, I don't have any fear whatsoever of the jinn. Um, but I have a terrible, I have a terrible natural fear of wasps. And I always wondered about how that man from the council can come and just climb up the ladder and just spray the wasp's nest and just bring it down. And I'm sat there shaking, you know, myself to death. SubhanAllah, it just shows you that I often give this example because it gives you a nice kind of perception of how the fact is that he knows how to deal with those particular animals. He knows that, yeah, they can hurt you. I mean, wasps can get a nasty sting from a hornet's nest. Some people, you can even die from a sting from a hornet's nest. But... The point is that he knows how to deal with them, he's proficient in dealing with them, and he deals with them and he brings them without any problem. And likewise, alhamdulillah, you can learn to be proficient in dealing with the jinn, and inshallah, you won't have any problems. So it's very, very important that you understand they are not to be feared. The greatest weapon and the greatest evil that the jinn have against us is our making us fear them like we fear Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You know, subhanAllah, the fear people have 
of these creatures is a fear beyond anything that I've seen of any creature, more than lions and snakes and scorpions and spiders and the fear people have of the jinn. And this is something that is not befitting for any Muslim. Yes, you naturally fear things. Of course, you, you have a natural, you can be naturally scared of spiders or you can be naturally scared of, you know, snakes or something like that. But this fear does not reach the fear that belongs only to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This fear that only but this knowledge that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala can touch you wherever you are. That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, if, if all of the world came together to save you and Allah wished to harm you, they would not be able to save you. And if all of the world came together to harm you and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wished to save you, they would not be able to harm you. Do not give the jinn these characteristics. They are not worth this kind of uh, honor and this kind of ta'zim that we have sometimes uh, as Bani Adam has given to these, to these jinn. So it's very, very important that people realize they are a creature just like spiders and snakes. And just like when you get used to picking spiders up and putting them outside, and just like when you, know, you see people who live uh, in the desert and they're perfectly used to scorpions and they don't particularly get particularly scared of them. Likewise, the jinn are a creature. They are not something to be scared of. They are not something to be terrified of. They're not something to give the attributes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to. Excellent. We've got some more things that we picked up from the, from the lecture, inshallah. I'm just going over a few, a few points, inshallah, before we get on to the actual topic. Bismillah. They can die. MashaAllah, excellent. They're not, they're not souls that live forever. They're not, and they're certainly not the souls of your dead granddad. Rahimahullah. Yeah, they're not, they're not uh, the dead. They are not all seeing. They are not all knowing. They don't know the future. All of these things that we can say, you know, subhanAllah, the jinn are simply a creature and they die like the humans die. And whether they live for a long time or a short time, it doesn't matter. I mean, there are tortoises that live for a lot longer than human beings, but we don't attribute divinity to them. And so it's very important that we understand this. Tafadl. Sorry. They're also naturally afraid. They're, very, they're naturally afraid of humans. They're not, uh, you know, we have this idea of the jinn being this huge, I think we probably get it from Ala ad din and some, you know, shirki type uh, stories that people tell of the jinn being these huge creatures that can crush a human in a blink of an eye. And, you know, subhanAllah, naturally the jinn are afraid of you. But when you start to fear them, and if I give you any advice, if you take anything today, is honestly the, least, the, the less you fear the jinn, the more successful you will be ta'ala in dealing with them. And the more you fear them, the more trouble they give you. I can honestly say that I have never been in a situation, despite having been in a situation with many of the jinn and, and many times, I've never ever seen them do anything that I would say was particularly like made me fear for my life, as in you know throwing knives around or anything like that. But I've seen it happen to other people. And I often said, there was a sister, she phoned and she said, my house is basically, if you like, haunted. Um, and the, the jinn smash the windows and they throw things across the room and they throw things at me and all of these things happen. And my advice to her, and this, I think this is, is inshallah good advice, is that if you don't show your fear of them, they will stop doing these things. They only do these things to get something out of you. It's like when people call you names, they call you names because they want you to bite back, right? And if you don't bite back after a while, they just give up. The jinn are very much like that. You know, they'll throw pots and pans around. And I usually say, you know, if you can throw a pot, I can throw a pot and pan around. SubhanAllah. And after a while, they'll just, they'll, they'll stop doing it because they know they're not going to get anything out of you. But when you start to show them something, you start to show them that fear and you start to show them that, you know, that awe and that surprise of what they're doing. And oh my God, you know, like there's a pan floating in midair or there's a, you know, the, the windows keep opening and closing and I feel scared to go in the room. Just go and sit in the room, inshallah, they'll stop doing it. They only do it to get a reaction out of you. So that's a very good, it's another, it's another important point. When Suleiman died, they didn't know what happened. So this tells us they, do, they don't have supernatural powers, they don't have the abilities of Allah, and they don't have ilm al ghaib. Excellent. I think that's most of the points. I think I, I, my next slide I had was what the jinn are not, what aren't the jinn. The jinn are not spirits of the dead. They're not all powerful. Uh, they're not fallen angels. That's a very important point to make, as is you know, traditionally mentioned in, um, in, in some Christian scriptures and in some other religious scriptures. Uh, and indeed, unfortunately, some Muslims who went very astray have also mentioned this 
Iblis is not a fallen angel. The angels do not disobey Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the angels have never disobeyed Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Indeed, Iblis was, as Allah Azawajal said in Surah Al-Kahf, Kana min al-jinn, fafasiqa an ammi rabbih. He was from the jinn and he disobeyed the command of his Lord subhanahu wa ta'ala. In this, it is worthwhile us just mentioning very quickly how we respond to somebody who says, why is it that Allah Azawajal says that all of the angels prostrated except Iblis? Does this not show us that Iblis was from the angel? Then we say that for those people who have knowledge of the Arabic language, this is very, very common and completely normal in Arabic. You can say all of the students left except the teacher. That's completely normal Arabic. It's not normal English but it's completely normal in Arabic for you to say all of the students left except the teacher. It's not necessary that the exception that you make is a part of the group that you are making the exception from. And so this statement that all of the angels prostrated except Iblis does not prove that Iblis was one of the angels. And this is obvious to those people who study the Arabic language in detail. And of course, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Kana min al-jinn, he was from the jinn. And this is a clear proof that Iblis was not a fallen, uh, a fallen angel. Okay, now we come on to, uh, again, uh, we want to just kind of cover the, the introductory topics before we get into how we protect ourselves. Jinn possession. We know that jinn have the ability to touch people or to possess people. We know that Allah Azza wa mentions this in the Quran. Those who devour riba will not stand on the day of resurrection except like the one who stands beaten by shaitan into insanity. And the word used here in, in, in Arabic is al-mas. And al-mas is what we call somebody who is touched by the jinn. And subhanAllah, you know, when you get into this, I will honestly say it really does raise your iman when you, when you see, pe when you see uh, people afflicted by the jinn and, and you, know, you are involved in, in helping those people. It really does raise your iman. And one of the things that you see is that you really appreciate just how evil riba is. When you see somebody who's beaten by the shaitan into insanity in this dunya and you see how horrible the situation is. And subhanAllah, some of them are like almost in a coma, they're so subhanAllah sick and so subhanAllah weak and, and, and troubled. And subhanAllah, it really does show you um, the evil of this. And I think whenever I read this ayah, I remind the brothers, you know, subhanAllah, when you see somebody who's afflicted by the jinn and you see it with your own eyes, subhanAllah, it really does show you the evil of riba and you really should appreciate that and, and the meaning of that that is concerned uh, within the ayah. The Prophet وسلم, said that the shaitan flows through the son of Adam like his blood. When is a person most vulnerable? Now we're getting onto the topic of how we remove ourselves. We'll inshallah take questions later. I'll kind of ask you guys and then hopefully we'll get to because I've got so many, so, so much stuff to cover. When is a person most vulnerable? In general, I think a person is most vulnerable at times when they forget Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And subhanAllah, the amount of stories that I have heard and the amount of people that I have seen who have been afflicted by the shaitan generally as a general rule 90 percent maybe more it comes from a time when they are when they are forgetful of allah subhanahu wa ta'ala extreme emotion extreme anger extreme passion extreme uh, you know upset times when you forget allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and anger especially this is a time when the shaitan is particularly able to have some control over you Times when you forget to remember Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Times when you forget your adhkar. I've heard more than one of the mashayikh say to me that he was involved in, in capturing uh, magicians in Saudi Arabia. And he said to me that there were times when he would forget to remember Allah in the morning. Or that he would forget to remember Allah before he went out. And he would find that his work was not effective on that day. And that the shaitan was able to get some control over him until he remembered Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And then the shaitan was, was taken away from him. And I think we have a clear evidence for this in the hadith of eating. When the Prophet sallallahu says that, you know, when you forget to say bismillah, the shaitan eats with you. So at this time, the shaitan has some control over you. He's eating with you. And then when you say, Bismillahi awwalahu wa akhira, the shaitan vomits up what he's eaten. So this shows us that this kind of thing, if we do some kind of you know, comparison here, we can see that times when you forget Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you are very, very vulnerable. But as soon as you remember Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the shaitan is pushed away from you and the effect of the shaitan is pushed away from you. As the brother said, impurity, times when you are impure places that are unclean places that are particularly isolated and inshallah we're going to talk in a few moments about how we can
protect ourselves in these kind of places. And of course, the basic idea is with the ad'iya, the dua that is mentioned in the book of Allah and in the sunnah of his messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. This is particularly why if we look at the sunnah prescribing certain ad'iya, certain dua that we make at certain times, we look at the sunnah telling us that there is a very important dua. Look at the dua when you enter the bathroom. And look at the dua when a person wants to have intimate relations with his wife. And look at the dua when a person visits a new place, especially an isolated or a deserted place. All of these dua have a particular thing in common. And that particular thing in common is that the dua, the essence of the dua is keeping the shaitan away from you. What does this tell us? It also tells us that these are times and places where we are particularly vulnerable to being attacked by the shaitan. Going into the bathroom, at times of intimate relations, this is a time when you forget Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and it's also a time when there's a certain degree of you know, impurity and a certain degree of uncleanliness. So this is a time when the shaitan, that's why the dua relates to what Allahumma jannibna shaitan. Oh Allah, keep the shaitan away from us. Because this is a time when you are vulnerable to the shaitan. Likewise, when you walk in the bathroom. Allahumma inni a'udhu bika min al khubuti wal khaba'ith. You're seeking Allah's refuge from the male and the female jinn. Because this is a time when you are vulnerable to them. Likewise, when you reach a new place and you set foot in a new place and you say, A'udhu bi kalimati Allahi tamati min sharri ma khalaq. I seek refuge in the perfect words of Allah from the evil that He created. Again, this is because you are vulnerable to that evil at this time. So when you see that there is a dua in the sharia that focuses upon keeping you away from the shaitan, you know by default that this is a particular time or a particular place where you may be vulnerable to the shaitan. Why does possession occur? Why do jinn possess people? I know we've probably touched on this a little bit in the beginning and this is also part of my topic, so we'll go over this in a little bit of detail. Because to understand how to protect yourself, you need to understand first of all, why is it that people get possessed? Why do people get possessed? I'll ask that question out to you guys. What have you heard of reasons why people get possessed? Or what have you learned from previous lectures of reasons why people get possessed? Okay, they could be possessed through a magician. We talk a little bit about that in a moment. Good. What else? What other reasons have you heard for people being possessed? You may have disturbed them like um, the, the way they live. Okay. You may have disturbed them without saying Bismillah. For example, you, I've heard of examples of them being hit by cars, uh, urinated on, uh, of, of them being stepped on, of boiling water being poured on them. And that's why... Generally, we announce our presence in the places where there is a, a likelihood of the jinn uh, ha inhabiting those places, like deserted places or like the bathroom. We announce our presence so that the believing jinn are also aware of us and they keep away from us and we don't accidentally harm them. Because we know from their nature they're a little bit fiery and there have been many cases, I've seen a few cases of Muslim jinn possession. And usually you have to reason with them and explain to them. You know it sometimes as a Muslim because you recite Ayatul Kursi and he says you made three mistakes in Ayatul Kursi and your Tajweed is terrible. And then he reads it back to you, MashaAllah, Tabarakallah, yani, with excellent Tajweed. And you say, SubhanAllah, I guess this is a Muslim jinn and you say, Ya Akhi, this is not permissible for you to do. And you need to fear Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala. And usually it's an impulse reaction. It's, it's like somebody who gets into a lot of fights, you know, like anyone looks at him wrong and he just jumps in, you know. So the jinn are very much like that. They're very fiery uh, in nature. Tafaddal Ya Akhi. They fall in love with people. That's um, uh, recently I, I recited upon a lady and when I recited upon her, uh, the jinn came out and he told me that his name was John. Um, although you never believe what they tell you because subhanAllah, wallahi, they lie so much. But um, he told me his name was John and he said that he'd fallen in love with her and he wasn't going to let anybody else touch her. This is something that is well known from the experiences of the mashayikh and the ruqa that people ha have had this experience. And, SubhanAllah, that it goes true for female and uh, male uh, jinn. And this can be another reason why Muslim jinn possess people sometimes. Um, other reasons why people, be, people uh, are possessed sometimes. It could be. You know, Qadr Allah, at the end of the day, everything happens by the Qadr of Allah and the Qadr of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And we never say that, subhanAllah, not everything we understand the cause. Sometimes Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tries a person with something like Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tried the Prophet وسلم, with being being mas'ur by, 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 by sihr, being, magic being done to the Prophet Sallallahu And he was afflicted by magic because some of his hair was taken by uh, one of the Jews of Medina and he performed magic on him. 
And this was not because the Prophet ﷺ forgot about Allah. Hasha wa kalla sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. That he would forget about Allah. Never. And this was not because he was, you know, at a time where he lost control of himself or something like that. No, not at all. This was a test from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and a lesson for the Muslims. So sometimes, you know, there are, uh, it's not always that there's a defined reason that you can draw, you know, a scientific one-to-one -one correlation. Not always. Okay, what else do I have on here? Um, in order to further the aims of the shaitan. Whatever the shaitan wants, and this is a, a general rule, the shaitan wants you to disbelieve in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That's what he's interested in. Have you ever wondered why it is that Christian preachers are able to expel the shaitan? Ever wondered why a Christian preacher can say, I ask you in the name of Jesus to leave and, he, and the, the shaitan leaves? Because the shaitan only wants you to disbelieve in Allah and once you have disbelieved in Allah, his job is done. Hey, thank you very much. It's an early night for me. I'm taking a break. And off he goes. Why? Because he knows that his job is done. <laughs> His job was to make you disbelieve in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us in the Quran about Iblis that Iblis said that, uh, that he will try to mislead as many of the slaves of Allah as he possibly can from in front of them and from behind them and from their right and from their left in as many ways as possible and that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will not find most of them to be grateful for the blessings of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So we know that this is the aim of Iblis. And when we know it's the aim of Iblis, we shouldn't be surprised if the shaitan leaves when you commit some kind of shirk. Likewise, you go to your, you know, your spiritual healer, this sahir who pretends to be a holy person, and you go to him and he gives you something to tie around your neck, and you tie it around your neck, and mashallah, no problems at all. Why? Because the shaitan is agreement. The shaitan's mashallah, quick, out. Because he knows that he's done his job. He has got that person to attach themselves to other than Allah. He has got that person to commit shirk. And for the rest of their life, they live with this shirk around their neck. They live with this polytheism around their neck. Because they, they now they have submitted themselves to the shaitan. And so why would the shaitan waste his time with this person? He has other people to mislead. He's very busy. He doesn't, he doesn't take a break. Quickly on to the next person. So you shouldn't be surprised when the evil methods that people use are successful because this is simply the promise of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and you can see from the ayat of the Quran why this is true. Okay, now one of the things that was assigned to me to talk about, common signs of possession. There are many, many signs of possession and I will warn you before I start talking about signs of possession, ya ikhwani, that this is something which shares these symptoms are shared with many illnesses do not think that everybody who has one of these symptoms is possessed okay now how, sometimes they are sometimes they aren't keep an open mind also don't be from those people who are so skeptical i hear them all the time oh subhanallah i don't i mean i know it says in the quran but i don't think anyone actually gets possessed this is not true people get possessed all the time but these symptoms i warn you not to like you know start like just like everyone who has for example a cold some of them might have influenza you know, some of them uh, might have, uh, you know, very, very, very serious. Some of them might have pneumonia and some of them might just have a common cold. So we should be careful not to apply all of these things blanket to everybody. OK, everybody who has this, they are so and so. No, that's not always uh, the case. But from the common signs of uh, possession are sudden rapid changes in personality and split personality. That includes bipolar disorder and schizophrenia. That doesn't mean that everybody with bipolar disorder is possessed or that everyone with schizophrenia is possessed, but it is very, very common to find that people suffering from personality disorders, split personalities, often uh, they do have some degree of problem either relating to magic or relating to possession. A change in facial structure or voice. I don't think I can quite describe to you how much a person's face changes when they are possessed by a jinn how you see the entire facial features change completely as if there is a different person in there. It's as though you're looking at them, but you're not looking at them. And maybe you know there are some things that some of you may have seen this in the past. Sudden displays of extreme emotion, often at inappropriate times, like crying suddenly at times when everyone is laughing or laughing at times when everybody is crying, often uncontrollably, and the person isn't able to explain why they are doing that. Again, that's not true that everybody like that is possessed. They may just have, you know, a particular nature, but often people who display these kind of symptoms are suffering from some kind of possession. An aversion or a reaction to the Qur'an or an aversion or a reaction to the Adhan. Sudden inexplicable illnesses that the doctors can't find any cure for. Complaints of crawling ants. Now when I say this, don't let everyone say, you know, start 
SubhanAllah, sometimes I see people when I say these things and people start getting paranoid. But the feeling of crawling ants, like ants crawling up your arms, like feeling of like certain shooting pains or shooting hot, uh, you know, heat shooting up the body, especially in the arms and especially in, you know, uh, sometimes in, in, the, in the body and in the sides and for women sometimes in the stomach and in the womb. Compression in the chest, extreme compression. Now again, somebody might just be having a heart attack. Um, but likewise, often people who complain from compressions in the chest are suffering from something like this. Epilepsy, fits and fainting for no reason and likewise hallucinations. These are all common signs of possession. But because many of these symptoms and signs are shared with ordinary illnesses and psychological disorders, it's always necessary to confirm possession. Now we say to somebody, there's no harm in doing that. If you suffer from epilepsy, why not go and have the Quran recited upon you? There's no harm, inshallah, it's not going to do you any harm. And maybe you'll find that it cures your epilepsy and maybe it won't. And alhamdulillah, you know, there are cases of both which are mentioned in the sunnah. We have the hadith of the lady who, radiallahu anha, who used to collapse from fits. And the Prophet ﷺ said, if you wish, I will make dua for Allah to cure you. And if I wish, and if you wish, then Allah will give you Jannah. So the Prophet ﷺ did not say to you, you're possessed by a shaitan and I will, and I will do ruqya upon you. So it shows us that it's not always the case. So it is necessary to confirm, confirm possession. And the more experience a person has in this field, the easier it is usually for you to confirm possession. Now, I don't agree with those people who look at somebody and say, you're possessed, you're possessed, you're possessed, and I can see the shaitan. But you get a feeling, and usually with a little bit of recitation and a little bit of questioning and answering some, some simple questions, you get a feeling for whether the person is suffering from uh, possession. But the basic way to confirm this is to perform ruqya, and this will be uh, discussed, inshallah, uh, shortly. Briefly talk about magic, very, very, very briefly. Magic is a contract between the magician and one or more of the jinn. That's what magic is. And I know there's a lecture coming on magic, so I'm not going to touch on it too much. But for you to understand how to get rid of it, which is what I'm going to talk about today, you have to understand what it is. The essence of magic is a contract between you and between the shaitan. Or between the magician and between the shaitan. And that contract that exists between the magician and between the shaitan, that is the essence of the magic. Sometimes it's a written contract, more often than not it's written. Sometimes it's a spoken contract, and sometimes it's something that is eaten or something that's inhaled and, and many of the other things. But this contract is the essence, and we need to understand this because we need to understand how to get rid of it by destroying uh, the contract. And the essence of the contract is the magician says, I'll do something for you, you do something for me. I'll perform shirk, I will stamp on the Quran, I will do this, I will do that, I will you know, commit the worst of sins, commit the worst of deeds, and in return, I would like you to do such and such for me. I would like this jinn to go and harm somebody, to go and hurt somebody. Um, it's important to know that magic is something which is learned. And we need to get away very, very, very quickly from this Harry Potter concept. Allahu Musta'an That little people are born as little wizards And they just, you know, they're harmless People are not born as wizards or witches And they, it is not harmless It is one of the most evil, evil things And subhanAllah, there are things that I would be shy to say In one of the houses of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala About what these people do But it's enough to say that magic is something that is learned It is something that people go out and learn it It is an act of disbelief when you perform it instantly, the one who performs magic is a kafir outside of the religion of Islam without any disagreement amongst the ulama of Islam. Magic is something that causes real harm. It is not tricks. It's not about sitting in a box of ice or water or whatever that shaitan did. But it's about causing real harm to people. Causing people to leave the religion, causing people to break up, causing families to break up, causing even little children. I've seen little children, a six-year-old girl I've read, I've read upon who was afflicted by magic. SubhanAllah, it shows you the lack of any kind of rahmah in the heart of the magician. That a six-year-old girl, what has that six-year-old girl done to that person? Out of spite and out of hatred and out of disbelief, that person wants to harm that little child. And that there is no harm without the permission of Allah and there is no such thing as good magic or white magic. We know that a person can't become a magician until they reach the highest form of disbelief and the more disbelief they do and the further they get into disbelief, the stronger their magic becomes. We said that what I do want to talk about with relation to magic is that the easiest way for us to get rid of magic is to destroy the contract that is made between the jinn and the magician. 
And if we are able to destroy this contract, then this is something which is the easiest way for us to get out of, uh, to, for us to, uh, to, to be able to destroy this magic, although it can also be destroyed by the recitation of the Quran and uh, similar things. Again, the purposes of magic, there are reasons why the magicians are involved in magic, such as financial gain, such as to gain respect in the community, to show power, to make someone love someone they hate, to make someone hate someone they love. And there are reasons why the shaitan is involved in magic, whose primary aim is to get people to disbelieve and to commit shirk, and who loves people to break up. He loves the Muslims to break up. Symptoms of being afflicted by magic. Generally, we can say everything we said about the symptoms for jinn possession are true about the symptoms of magic. But there are some things that kind of distinguish it a little bit and make it seem that this is actually a little bit different to jinn possession because both magic and jinn possession relate to the jinn. The jinn is the one who is causing the actual, causing the actual harm. There are some slightly different characteristics. Sudden love or hate, which is against character. Suddenly somebody absolutely hates their wife, can't stand to even look at her. Suddenly a woman absolutely hates her husband. She says that when she looks at him, she sees the face of a monster. These kind of like sudden love or hate. Incurable sickness which seems to have no cause. Break up of families, especially between husband and wife. Seeing people in a different light. Massive changes in personality which cause harm to the person and those around them. And strange behaviors such as refusing to do certain things, like refusing to leave the house at certain times or refusing to eat certain types of food. Again, these are very general things, but these are some of the things that kind of lead you towards maybe this is something related to magic uh, rather than necessarily jinn possession. Just briefly, the difference between the two, both of them involve the jinn. However, possession is really the act of the jinn acting on their own. When we're talking about jinn possession, we're talking about jinn inhabiting somebody of their own accord. When we're talking about magic, we're talking about the jinn doing it on behalf of the magician. And there is much more disbelief involved and much more evil involved. And so it is naturally much more um, stronger and much sometimes, except who Allah wills for, it can be more difficult uh, to get rid of. One thing I was asked also to talk about today, and this is all the theoretical stuff before we get on to how to protect ourselves, is the evil eye. The evil eye, the best way to think of it is to think of it as a kind of illness, which some people are afflicted with. You know when people, some people carry a certain gene, a certain uh, gene, and it means that they carry an illness, they themselves are not sick, but they are able to infect other people. This is kind of like what the evil eye is. The evil eye means that when that person feels jealous of somebody, instead of the usual things that happen from jealousy, instead of, you know, um, causing just a problem for the jealous person, it actually causes harm to the person that they are jealous of. So it's kind of like that person is carrying a sickness or an illness. It's not affecting them, but it means that whenever they are jealous of somebody, that jealousy ends up affecting that person that they are jealous of. Therefore, we can say everybody who gives the evil eye is jealous, but not everybody who is jealous gives the evil eye. Many people can be jealous and the only person they harm is themselves. The only thing they do is they lose their good deeds. They don't actually harm the other person. But there are some people who through no fault of their own know that when they are jealous, they inherently hurt the people they are jealous of. And it can even cause death, it can cause severe injury and it can cause very, very, very severe problems for people. It can even be given to yourself. You can even give the evil eye to yourself or to your own children or to your own uh, possessions. Imam Ahmed and Tirmidhi narrated in his jami' that Asma bint Umais radiallahu anha said, O Messenger of Allah, the children of Ja'far have been afflicted by the evil eye. Shall we recite Ruqya for them? He said, yes. For if anything were to overtake the dec divine decree, it would be the evil eye. The evil eye is something very strong and something very real. But it's not something to just be used as an excuse for things. But it is something very strong and very real. Signs of the evil eye include someone with some kind of praiseworthy attribute being suddenly afflicted in that specific thing. Now this is very different from jinn possession and very different from magic. This is somebody, let's say, who has a very handsome face suddenly breaking out in spots or lumps or boils. Or somebody who has a nice voice suddenly not being able to recite anymore. 
or somebody who has, I don't know, particularly nice hair, suddenly becoming bald. This is the kind of thing, not always, but as a general rule, I'm trying to give you some kind of general advice as to when you put something as being magic, possession, evil eye. Evil eye tends to be something where someone has a praiseworthy attribute, somebody has been jealous of that attribute and afflicted them, and usually they've been afflicted in the same attribute that that person was jealous of, although not always, sometimes it can be more general. By saying Tabarakallah, or Masha Allah Tabarakallah, and remember the Sunnah is to say Tabarakallah specifically. So either you say Masha Allah Tabarakallah, or you say Tabarakallah, or some people from the ulama say, whatever you say to remember Allah is enough, that this uh, uh, stops a person from giving the evil eye. And you all should be very careful when you see something you like from yourself or from anybody else, that you say Tabarakallah, you say Masha Allah Tabarakallah and you get into the habit, and especially those brothers and sisters who know that they give the evil eye. Because after a while, you become aware that you give the evil eye, and you start to say, SubhanAllah, actually, I am one of those people who can actually give someone the evil eye. These people, it is obligatory upon them to do everything they can to avoid this. First of all, by saying, Masha Allah, Tabarakallah, and secondly, if they do hurt somebody, that they immediately own up and say, SubhanAllah, I didn't intend that, but I know that this is something that happens from me. Let me immediately perform the cure, and we'll talk about the cure for the evil eye in a moment. Okay, so now we come on to the topic of the ways that we protect ourselves. All that we've talked about so far has been an introduction to the topic kind of going over the main points, some of the symptoms, some of the realities of what we're dealing with. And now we come to talk about the weapons, the means of protection that we use to protect ourselves. And the first thing that I wanted to talk about is that just like real weapons, sometimes our weapons against the shaitan can be blunt. And just like if you're trying to cut something with a blunt knife, it's a lot harder Likewise, that sometimes when you are uh, doing the things that are mentioned in the sunnah as a means of protection, you actually cause yourself, uh, you can actually make things very difficult for yourself or very easy for yourself with the permission of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We know what we do if we have a blunt knife, we, we sharpen it. If we have a blunt sword, we sharpen it. If we have you know, any kind of weapon, we, we do what is necessary to make that weapon in working order. So what do we do to make these means of protection in working order? What do we do to sharpen our weapons against the shaitan? It depends on our iman, our aqidah, and our trust in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It's vital that you realize that all forms of harm and all forms of benefit come from Allah and that nobody, no raqi, no person on the face of this earth has the ability to harm or to help you besides Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If Iraqi is able to help you, he has helped you by the permission of Allah and by the virtue of Allah and by a gift from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And it's Allah who deserves thanks before he does. We should not become and attach our hearts to individuals and to their abilities. And our ability to benefit our brothers and sisters is only given to us by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So what weapons do we have against the shaitan, against the evil eye, against magic, against the jinn? What weapons do we have? The book of Allah is our most powerful weapon. The Quran is a cure for every illness, whether it's related to jinn or whether it's related to something else, evil eye or something else. The Quran is a cure for every single illness. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, and we sent down from the Quran that which is healing and mercy for the believers, but it does not increase the wrongdoers except in loss. The Quran is used in a form of ruqya, and we're going to talk specifically about ruqya at the end. And the dua in the Quran are used for protection. So the Quran is our most powerful weapon against the shaitan. Dua. Dua is our next most powerful weapon. Dua reminds us that nobody can remove the harm we are suffering except Allah. I've told you that the best way we can get rid of magic is to destroy the contract. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He is the one who knows where that contract is. He is the one who knows where the jinn are. He is the one who can protect us from the jinn. If all of the jinn were to gather together to harm us, they wouldn't be able to harm us unless Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala willed. There are specific dua which accompany ruqya. Dua can be used as a cure. And there are specific times when dua is required to protect you, as we mentioned. And in this, rather than me sit here and mention all of the different ad'iyah, the different dua, I advise the brothers to get a hold of Fortress of the Muslim, 
to get a hold of the other books of dua like Al-Kalim Al-Tayyib and, and, and uh, Al-Nawawi's book and some of the other books that have been translated into English and to learn the dua that relate to A, protection and B, cure. Because these duas are two types. Duas that protect us from the jinn, from the shaitan, from uh, the evil eye, dua that protect us uh, from um, uh, from magic and so on and so forth, such as A'udhu bi kalimati Allahi tammati min sharri ma khalaq and other dua. And there are dua that we can use to cure, dua that form a part of ruqya. For example, the statement Bismillah ar rahim min kulli shaitan in yu'zik. That oh, in the name of Allah, I recite upon you, in the name of Allah, I perform ruqya to, to, you know, in, uh, against every shaitan that harms you. So there are du'as that we can use for protection and du'as that we can use for a cure. Important du'a for protection, we said, entering the bathroom, entering the house when we eat, um, seeking refuge with the perfect words of Allah, uh, du'a leaving the house, uh, du'a when traveling, du'a when eating, du'a when having intimate relations between husband and wife. These are all very important du'as that we need to learn, minimum standard for every single Muslim. Another weapon that we have against the shaitan, believe it or not, is water. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has made water mubarak. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, and we have sent down blessed rain from the sky, and we have made grow their Bible gardens and grain from harvest. The most blessed form of water that we can use is of course, zamzam. After that, I would say rain water, and after that, any form of water that we find. This water is very, very, very useful against these kind of things. First of all, it can be recited upon. You can recite the Quran upon the water. So you read Ayatul Kursi and you read the last couple of surahs of the Quran and you blow upon the water like this. You blow upon it and then you can give it to the sick person to drink. And often this is very, uh, very effective. Likewise, especially if somebody's being given magic to eat. And that's quite common that people put magic in people's food and it's given to them to eat. That often when they drink this water that's been recited upon, they will vomit up the magic that they have. Uh, eaten and if somebody is suffering from possession or magic they'll often almost certainly they will refuse to drink this water or they will find it very very hard to drink likewise one of the weapons that we have against the shaitan is dates the messenger of Allah sallallahu alaihi wasallam said whoever eats seven dates in the morning will not be afflicted by poison or magic on the day that he eats them now there are many various narrations of this hadith one of them mentions dates one of them mentions ajwa dates one of them mentions dates of Medina, one of them mentions Ajwa of Medina, and one of them mentions Ajwa from Aliyatul Medina, which is a particular area of Medina north of the Qibla. What I usually say to people is this, if you can get Ajwa dates from Aliyatul Medina, Alhamdulillah, this is the best thing that you can use. You eat seven in the morning before you eat anything else. You do that believing firmly that nothing will harm you. Wallahi, there is no sahir in the world. There is no magician in the world that can harm you. And I've heard stories and seen examples time and time again when times when the shaitan has gone to attack somebody and they've simply said, I ate seven dates this morning and the person has been unable or the, the magician has been scared of them and unable to, to afflict them. So seven dates is very important, especially for people who feel that they are at risk or they might be afflicted by magic. So seven dates in the morning, if you can get ajwa from Ali to Medina, alhamdulillah. If you can't, and you can get Ajwa dates, Alhamdulillah. If you can't, but you can get Medina dates, any Medina dates, Alhamdulillah. If you can't get them, then any dates, Bismillah, Tawakkalna ala Allah, and inshallah this will be enough for you. And there is you know, considerable disagreement amongst the scholars about which of these narrations is more befitting. So I usually say to people, try for the more specific. If you can't, go down and down and down until if you find any dates, inshallah, seven dates that you find, you know, فَاتَّقُوا ma stata'atum Fear Allah to the extent that you are able. Likewise, from the weapons that we can use to protect ourselves from the shaitan is honey. Honey is one of the things that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala described as a cure. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says there emerges from their bellies a drink varying in colors in which there is a healing for people. Indeed, and this is a sign for people who give thought. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala described it as a cure and it is a cure for every kind of illness and one of the blessed foods that Allah has given us. So we can use it again as a cure for these kind of afflictions. Cupping or hijama is from the advice of the angels. The messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa said, I did not pass by an angel from the angels on the night journey, except that they all said to me, you must do cupping, O Muhammad. It's narrated by Ibn Majah. 
Cupping is a general cure for all illnesses. Al-Bukhari narrated, Rahimahullah, indeed the best of remedies you have is cupping. It's possible that a possessed person or a person afflicted by magic or the jinn, when they are cupped, the jinn may make himself apparent and come out in the person and it's easier to treat them with ruqya then. Cupping, as we know, for those people who don't know what it is, it involves making small incisions at various places of the body with a small needle or a small uh, razor blade and then uh, something hot is placed in a cup over the area and the blood is sucked out and at this time this is very 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 beneficial as a protection and as a cure for some of these uh, afflictions. Likewise, we talked about being able to burn the, the magic contract. If you find a ta'weez, you find a ta'weez or you find something that appears to be from this actions of the shaitan or it appears to be some form of magic that was done or you doubt about it and usually you can see just to give some examples and I know next week inshallah I think or, or when the brother comes next to talk about magic he'll talk about it in more detail inshallah but you'll see for example strange shapes strange names uh, ayat of the Quran written in blood or ayat of the Quran written on strange paper maybe powders inside you'll see uh, circles you'll see things written inside stars of David with things written inside of it. Um, you'll see squares with letters, random letters written in or random numbers. Anything like this you see, the best way to protect yourself from it is first of all to seek refuge with Allah from the shaitan. You can read upon it the ayah uh, قَدْ جَاءَ الْحَقُّ وَزَهَقَ الْبَاطِلِ and if you wish, you know, whatever of the ayat, you know, you know, قُلْ هُوَ اللَّهُ أَحَدُ قُلْ عَوْذُ بِرَبِّ الْفَلَاقِ قُلْ عَوْذُ بِرَبِّ النَّاسِ and you simply burn it until it no more remains. And this is how we treat because often they have the name of Allah there so we don't throw it in the bin. We burn it and then if you were to take the ashes and to sprinkle them in clean earth or to put them in water which has been recited upon, this is something that some of the mashayikh recommend. However, if any of these taweez or any of these magic contracts contain knots, you must be very careful that you get rid of all of the knots by, un by unfolding them or by cutting them until the knot does not remain because these knots like Allah Azza wa Jal says in Surah Al-Falaq, women, women, uh, women from the evil of the women who blow on the knots. They tie knots and they, they blow on the knots. So you must remove the knots that you find in them. Um, and you know, generally you, you treat this like you would treat anything that has the name of Allah on it, uh, that you burn it uh, or that you, you, know, you dispose of it appropriately, but you destroy that piece of paper or that object as completely as you possibly can. And as many times I've seen that when you destroy it, if it is to do with magic, often the person will be cured immediately, just simply upon burning it and reciting. But you must remember to recite, because many times I personally have seen things that they just look like ordinary metal or paper, but you can't rip it. You can't even, I've set things on light with petrol and it doesn't burn until you recite upon it and then it burns. So it is something that you, you, know, you should be aware of. One of the best things that you can do to protect yourself from all of these afflictions is your house and your environment. Having an Islamic household, having an Islamic environment is from the greatest of weapons that you can have. It makes it extremely difficult for the shaitan and it makes the ruqya more effective. And when I used to ask the mashayikh about certain cases that I found difficult, he would always say, go back to the house, focus on the house. Try and make the house a place that's beloved to Allah. Get rid of the pictures. Get rid of the you know, things that please the Indian movies or whatever. Things that please the shaitan. Get rid of them. And this way you know, you'll find your ruqya is more effective. Make your place uh, a place of worship uh, for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Regarding the evil eye specifically, the cure is to ask the person to make wudu. To retain the water that comes off them from the wudu and to, to pour it over or to bathe the person who is afflicted and inshallah they'll be cured by the permission of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It's worth noting that it is obligatory upon every Muslim who is asked to make wudu for this reason. Someone comes and says, Akhi, look, would you mind making we have somebody afflicted by the evil eye? You do not turn around and say to them, Astaghfirullah, how could you dare accuse me of this? No, you say to them, of course I will make wudu. Just out of, you know, courtesy to a person. It's obligatory upon a Muslim when they are asked to make wudu for this purpose that they make wudu and they don't argue about it. What can you do if a person refuses? Now this is where experience comes in. There is no Quranic or, or, or Sunnah explanation of what you can do if the person refuses. But let me just give you a, a little bit of a, an idea what you can do. Generally we found, and Allah knows best, and this is purely from experience, that if you are able to get something from the person such as their hair 
or you know saliva or something like that and you are to put it in the water and mix it and then bathe the person in the water inshallah they'll be cured by the permission of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and this is not something from the sunnah but some of the mashayikh mention it from experience so you know if you are absolutely unable they, everybody refuses to make wudu one of the mashayikh said what he used to do is to give out dates to people and he would collect the stones from the dates and put the stones in the water and wash it over the person and be idhnillahi tabarak wa ta'ala they'll be cured. And again, this is not something I advise the brothers to do because it's not from the sunnah. But I just say as a last resort, when you have no other choice and the person is perhaps very, very sick, then inshallah ta'ala, there's no harm in you, you know, uh, obtaining something from them secretly and, you know, putting, it, especially when you know who the person is and putting it in some water and bathing the person, asking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make it a cure for them. The final thing that we come on to today, subhanAllah, so much to talk about in so little time and I'm trying to, to keep it as compact as possible is we come on to the, the topic of Ruqiyah and exorcism in Islam. Ruqiyah is the recitation of the Quran with the intention of curing somebody. A person can perform Ruqiyah upon themselves or it can be recited over them by somebody else. The whole of the Quran is a cure. But there are some specific ayat which are mentioned in the sunnah as being particularly effective or particularly appropriate when you are performing uh, ruqya. In terms of the permissibility or the hukam, the ruling of ruqya, there is no doubt that ruqya is permissible. Jibreel performed ruqya alayhi salam over the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam and in turn the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam allowed and taught his companions to perform it. However, we also have the hadith of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam about the 70,000 who enter paradise without reckoning or punishment and in it it says humul la yastabhun. They are those who do not ask for ruqya to be done. So we say, how do we join between these two, to these two things? We say a few things. We say the most complete form of a person's iman is that you don't rush out to seek to people to make ruqya for you. You know, you don't like every time you have a cough or a cold, you know, run out and ask people to make ruqya. It's because you end up being attached to that person, especially if you're cured. Imagine somebody is sick, very, very sick, perhaps even dying, and somebody recites upon them and they are cured they have some degree of attachment in their heart to that person. And that's something that you know, can take away from the completeness of your Iman. Your ultimate trust should always be in Allah. However, if somebody is sick, you should not refrain from asking when you need to. It's very, very important, Ya Ikhwan. You're thinking about being from the 70,000 who enter Jannah without Hisab and without Adab, and SubhanAllah, the person, the poor person is you know, virtually dying in front of you. You know, when you need to, you must ask. Just like the Prophet ﷺ, Jibreel, he didn't ask Jibreel, but Jibreel came and he recited. And likewise, this hadith, it, it shows that, it, it, it shows that um, asking and, and you know, going out and saying to someone, please, can you come and do ruqya on me? But that's not the same as somebody who offers and says, Ya Akhi, maybe I just recite something on you, you'll feel a little better. There's no harm in that and that does not take you, you know, decrease from your iman. So we say to the people generally, don't be frightened to ask for help when you need it. Don't be frightened to ask for advice. Try yourself first so that you can be from those people who have complete iman. You know, you try your best, but often the person is just too sick to recite on their own. And in this case, there's no harm in that person seeking the help of somebody else. First of all, their heart is attached to Allah and Allah alone, and then seeking the help of somebody to help them by the permission of Allah uh, uh, to do this. And we mentioned that performing ruqya is from the highest forms of jihad for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is from the highest of the jihad against the shaitan without a shadow of a doubt and this is mentioned by Shaykh al-Islam Ibn Taymiyyah now we come on to the topic who should perform ruqya I'm going to try and keep this inshallah 5-10 minutes max inshallah who should perform ruqya who is it that is qualified to perform ruqya anybody can perform ruqya however there's no doubt that the more experience a person has the easier it is with the permission of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala the first condition that I say for a person to perform ruqya is sound aqidah because if you have anything like your errors or um, misguidance in your aqidah, the shaitan is just going to use it against you and against you just to turn you as far away from the path of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as he is able. That person must be a person who is uh, muhafid, uh, you know, uh, that is constantly uh, remembering Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that's engaged in dua, that does the dua in the morning and in the evening, that prays fajr with the jama'ah as much as possible. They must be a person who's patient and persevering. I went to the Sheikh and I told you I would tell you the story and I, I said to the Sheikh, I said, Sheikh, I've heard about this, this, my friend of mine and his sister is very, very, very sick. 
and I want to ask you whether you think it would be beneficial for me to recite. The Sheikh said, look, you need two things. He said, you need most of all, he said after he mentioned Aqeedah and recitation of the Quran and the ability to recite the Quran, he said, you must be able to be patient and to persevere. You must be, you, he goes, you will see ajaib, you will see things that you can't describe. I, I've seen things I can't describe to you. You will see things you can't describe. And if you can be patient upon all of that, subhanAllah, many times when you recite, you get pains, the jinn tries to, you know, bu bu stop you from reciting, you feel sick, you feel like you need to go to the toilet, or you start to feel, you know, like, you, you feel like uh, you're being afflicted or not that you're going to be harmed but it tries to put you off anything that can happen to put you off or you feel scared or you feel whatever if you're able to be patient upon all of that then inshallah that shows that you have the right characteristics to perform this action the ability to be patient you know you see everybody else is screaming crying you know, by this time, every, all of the men have run upstairs and barricaded them themselves in the room and they're, you know, Allah, I've seen Shabab, you know, Shabab like you guys, mashallah, who are, after a Rukia session, they won't go upstairs and switch off the light because they're scared to go upstairs and switch off the light. You know, you've got to have that kind of personality that is very strong in that sense, that you're able to be patient and persevere. The jinn will always try to scare you. Many times, oh, I'll try to kill you, I'll kill your family, I'm sending someone now to kidnap your children, I'm, 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 I'm. And you just reply to them that whatever happens, happens by the permission of Allah, and nothing is going to harm me unless Allah wills. If you are able to kind of maintain your, you know, keep your head when everyone else is losing theirs, then inshallah, you are a good person to perform uh, ruqya. And also, don't be frightened if you, you know, if you're performing ruqya on yourself, ask for someone to help, but maybe carry on doing it upon yourself, and focus on it, but you just ask for someone's help when uh, you are in need. And I think this is an appropriate time to mention the danger of fake practitioners of Rukia and people who take extortionate amounts of money to, to perform Rukia. Many of them are they themselves magicians, and I'm sure the brother will talk about this in the magic uh, lesson or in the magic lecture. But a lot of the people who come to perform Rukia also are, are, are often seek extortionate amounts of money. And unfortunately, um, there is a particular brother who I am thinking of who advertises his services around, the, the, around England, particularly in this, in this masjid as well. And uh, the brother's not from Birmingham, but he's, um, I know that, for example, where he takes extortionate amounts of money to come. And when he comes, he just says to everybody, oh, you, you have a, you have a um, marad nafsi, you have a, you know, like a psychological illness. And subhanAllah, you know, these type of people, if you see somebody who you think is afflicted and someone comes and recites for five minutes, takes 200 pounds off you and says, oh, it's, uh, it's psychological, you should admit them into a mental hospital, then you know that this is not a sincere person. SubhanAllah, the minimum that a person should do is to understand where you're coming from and to try to help you. And alhamdulillah, the Quran is a cure for everything. So we should not be frightened to embrace the cure of the Quran. Okay, how do we actually perform this ruqya? Very quickly, five minutes. How do we perform this ruqya? Remember, first of all, the only thing in your head when you're performing this ruqya is that nothing can harm or benefit except Allah. Second thing, it's not necessary for you to touch the person. It's not necessary for you to grab hold of their head. It's not necessarily for you to sit on them. And this is all from experience. I've seen people do this, yeah? And especially when it comes to women. Ya ikhwan, how do you want the tawfiq of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala if you're going to be touching a non-mahram woman? Or you're going to be sitting on her or holding her hands down or something like that. Subhanallah. But the ruling of treating women is that you are like a doctor. You may look at the minimum you need to perform your operation. And you know the minimum amount of contact that you, you know, to perform that operation. Just like a doctor or a surgeon. You try not to have any. And if you must have any kind of contact, it's absolute minimum. Just like a doctor. Just like the ruling of anything in Islam. You know, for example, you don't touch, uh, you know, a non-mahram woman. If a woman faints in front of you, you don't stand there and say, you, you, at this time, there are necessities. But you do your very, very best to always make, you know, make sure the mahram is there and the mahram, he is the one who is interacting with the woman. He is the one who's sitting with her. He leaves, you leave. Because khalwa is not permissible in Islam for you to be alone uh, together with her as a, 
even though, you know, unfortunately, this is, I mean, to be honest, Rukia is a man's job. It's not, it's not a job for the sisters. It's a very difficult job. It's a very physically demanding job. And it's a very mentally demanding job. And whoever Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives them their tawfiq. So sometimes it is necessary to recite upon ladies, but when it is done, it should be done with very, very strict and within the sharia as much as possible. Okay, any part of the Qur'an can be recited, but particularly there are particular parts of the Qur'an. What particular parts of the Qur'an do we use in Ruqya? There is like a kind of a generic one that we use kind of for everything. The beginning of Surah Al-Baqarah, Ayat Al-Kursi, the end of Surah Al-Baqarah, um, the last uh, three surahs of the Qur'an. This is all stuff that everybody can do, inshallah. If you believe the person is afflicted with magic, then any of the ayat that relate to magic, such as the ayah, I think it's ayah number 102 from Surah Al-Baqarah, This ayah that the shaytan followed, uh, uh, they followed what the shaytan uh, invented from the time of Sulaiman. It was not Sulaiman that disbelieved, but it was the shaytan uh, that disbelieved. This ayah, again relating to magic, and the ayat in Surah Al-Araf and Surah Yunus and the other ayat that relate to magic, any ayah that relates to the power of Allah, any ayah that relates to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala curing a person, these are all things that you can recite. But always, always, Ikhwan, focus upon two things more than anything. Surah Al-Baqarah, there is nothing like it. And the last two surahs or the last three surahs of the Qur'an. This should be your mainstay when you are reciting upon somebody. And don't be frightened to sit and recite the whole of Surah Al-Baqarah from beginning to end. Because it is an amazing protection uh, against the shaitan, but if you want to recite short, then you know the first couple of pages, ayat al kursi, and the last uh, two ayat from Surah al Baqarah are all authentically mentioned uh, in terms of practicing ruqya. Don't forget Surah al Fatiha as well, because it is known, and I think there's going to be a lecture specifically on this as part of uh, this series. Ta'ala. What do you expect when you actually perform ruqya? When you actually recite on somebody, what's going to happen? Sometimes nothing at all. Um, but the person may have a very strong reaction. They may go into a fit, they may become unconscious, the jinn may begin to speak, they may begin to scream, to laugh, to cry, to hit out at you. Um, they may try to discourage you, they may put their hands over their ears. Um, you get many, many, many different reactions. They may start to suddenly vomit and you should be prepared for them. You shouldn't be scared of them, but you should be prepared to handle these different things that happen. And inshallah, you know, when nothing happens, you carry on with that recitation, even if nothing happens. You carry on with it because alhamdulillah, the Quran is a cure uh, for everything. As a simple ruqya, for example, recite Surah Al-Fatiha, recite the beginning, the first page and a half of Surah Al-Baqarah, recite Ayat Al-Kursi, recite uh, the end of Surah Al-Baqarah, uh, and recite the last three surahs of the Quran. This is an example of a very simple form of ruqya that you can perform, and the more you know of the Quran, the easier it is for you to pick those ayat that have a particular relevance uh, to what it is that you are doing. So inshallah, this is uh, as much as I could squeeze in inshallah to the talk today and it's a huge topic. And honestly, if I was to have all five of these lectures, I don't think I would be able to finish this topic uh, with you guys. But alhamdulillah, you know, as much as I was able, that's kind of as much information as I, as I you know, can, can fit into the time that we have. What I did want to do is to ask, is to, is to give some time for questions inshallah. So whoever wants, you know, you feel free guys. It's been a long time. Those who want to leave are welcome and those who want to ask questions are, are welcome inshallah. Can I just um, jump, jump in there? Sorry, Fadal, just a couple of announcements before we move on to the questions. Um, Barakah Afiq, first of all, for that, um, that talk. And Barakah Afiq, um, Um Just um, want to ask everyone in the audience, I want to get a bit of participation going here. Can everyone who's, um, who's a parent put their hand up? So anyone that has any children, just put their hand up. Keep, keep your hands up. So everyone that has any children, put, put their hand up. Okay. Keep your hand up if you want your child or your children to become a fat of the Qur'an. You want to, want to memorize all of the Qur'an, if that's your intention. Keep your hand up. Do you want your, keep your hand up if you want your child to be... Um, an ambassador for Islam, someone who loves Islam, who embodies Islam as they're going through school and carrying out, carrying, carrying themselves in their daily lives. Keep your, keep your hands up. Okay, mashallah. A lot of you here, mashallah. Okay, tomorrow is a lecture taking place, or a seminar rather. You see the post at the front and at the back, and a little one here, um, dealing with these type of topics. So if you have any, uh, any children going through school age or of any, any age, then I encourage all parents to attend this seminars and this, um, Topics like setting high aspirations and aims for your children and dealing with how to actualize them, um, instilling the love for Islam in your child and making them be an ambassador, ambassador for Islam, and tips on also on how to make your child into a hafiz of the Book of Allah. 
Um, so I encourage everyone to attend this seminar tomorrow. Speakers include Elias Karmani, Murtaza Khan, Ahsan Hanif, and it starts at one o'clock and that will be taking place here. Um, brothers and sisters are welcome to attend. Um, one more annou announcement is that the book that was mentioned, Fortress of the Muslim, is available in the shop outside as, as well as many other CDs and DVDs and, and books as well. So if you want to purchase that or anything else, it's available outside. And as uh, the brother said during the, during the talk, next week's talk is going to be on uh, the world of magic and the one after that. Regarding the evil eye, um, there are, there are du'a that are specifically mentioned, such as the du'a, أعوذ بكلمات الله التامة من كل شيطان وهامة من كل عين لامة. This mentions the evil eye. And likewise, Ruqya generally from the evil eye, Surah Al-Baqarah is very, very effective, I found. And, and one of the Mashaykh, uh, Sheikh Ali bin Ghazi, he actually told me, one of the first stories he told me about Ruqya that he performed was actually his, his, his little girl. Um, she uh, suddenly became very, very sick. Um, and basically what happened was she was playing with her cousins. She was a very small little girl and she was brushing her hair. And the cousins had commented on how beautiful her hair was. And they hadn't said, MashaAllah, Tabarakallah, and she'd been afflicted, the little girl with the evil eye. And the Shaykh said that he, he simply recited Surah Al-Baqarah, and I found this generally against the evil eye to be very effective. And some people use, you know, more specific ayat. Uh, like I said, you know, generally you can stick to the generic ruqya that I've told you there. Or likewise, you, you know, the more of the Qur'an you know, if you feel that something in the Qur'an is particularly relevant to the topic, um, that is particularly, you know, certainly, without a shadow of a doubt, the last two surahs of the Qur'an. And especially... Uh, because this obviously encompasses the evil eye from the evil of the jealous person when they're jealous. So from the evil eye, the basic cure is, you make, is, is if you know the person who's done it, they make wudu, you take the remainder of the water that they've made wudu from and you bathe the person in it and they will be cured inshallah. This is the quick cure. And the slightly more long cure is, or the slightly longer cure is uh, to perform basic ruqya. And you can do any of the ruqya that I mentioned, or you can read something that's more specific, depending on how much of the Quran you know. Those of you who are father of the Quran will know many, many ayat and think this ayah is suitable and this ayah, you know, there are ayahs, for example. If I become ill, then he is the one that cures me. Or, and if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala touches me with evil, then nobody can remove it except for him. And if he touches me with good, then he is able to do all things. So, you know, the more of the Quran you know, the more you'll be able to pick out ayat that you think are particularly relevant. But generally, you know, Surah Al Baqarah and the last three, two or three surahs of the Quran, particularly. Tafadaliya. Allahu Akbar. Walaikum salam. You mentioned something in relation to the magic side, and as to having a contract between, say, the magician and, and, and uh, the jinn. Yeah. Now, in particular, we're more aware around probably the, the opportunity that you wear around the neck. Now, you mentioned something in regards to uh, pieces of paper or not something with knots. Now, are these actually found near someone's house, or where are they normally placed? They can be found in many different places. Uh, these contracts that exist, and I'm sure, inshallah, I'm very briefly covering it because I'm sure the brother, I don't want to take away the brother's lecture for next week, inshallah. Um, uh, but uh, for example, you sometimes see the person has it on them, sometimes sewn into their clothes, sometimes they don't even know. Sometimes they're given a gift by somebody, like a vase, or a, a, like, um, a, a, sometimes a teddy bear, or sometimes some clothing that has it in it. Uh, sometimes it's buried in their garden, sometimes it's in their house. Sometimes it's very far away, sometimes the jinn take it and bury it somewhere. Sometimes the magician buries it in, in graveyards. I've seen it buried, I've seen it hung on trees. Um, it can be very, very, very varied. And really the only, you know, the only thing a person can do is to, to ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to remove it and to ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to show a person where it is. And I've actually heard several stories of people who upon making dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, they've had phone calls or they've become aware of where the magic is. And sometimes you just come across it. But whatever you find of that nature, you know, you should always uh, destroy it. Wallahu tabarak wa ta'ala alam. Tafaddali am. Um, I've seen both of them done. I don't think it's entirely necessary. It's certainly not absolutely necessary for you to blow. But the basic idea of the ruqya is that you blow upon uh, the person. You spit without spitting, if you like. You know, you blow the recitation upon somebody, specifically upon, you know, if you're doing it upon water. Um, although it's definitely not necessary. I mean, several times 
ruqya is, is often just as effective by the person listening and hearing the Quran as it is by blowing. And if you blow in shah, it's more effective. Shall we say it's loudly or just the... I often find that the louder you recite, it has a profound effect upon the jinn, especially if the ayah is particularly meaningful, if particularly relevant to the topic. If you, you know, when you get to ayat, of course, you've read the whole of Surah Al-Baqarah, you can't read it all in a really loud voice. You won't, you know, your voice won't last. But then you get to ayat al-Kursi and you raise your voice, you see the physical effect upon the jinn is very, very severe. So I asked the, some of the mashayikh about this and I asked them about coming close to the person. Um, obviously, sisters accept it, not with the exception of a, a non-mahram lady. Um, is that there's no harm in coming close to the person and coming close to their ear and reciting sometimes uh, even though it's not necessary but when you do it again it can be very effective and generally you know you get a feeling for it when you see something you do is very effective you know you can repeat it inshallah even an ayah if you see the ayah had a particular effect repeat the ayah inshallah and there's no harm inshallah in it Tfadal ya akhi hayakallah So if we have, a, for example, a madrasa, we have a madrasa in which um, it has been traditionally a place of shirk, a place of magic, and we find that despite reciting Surah Al-Baqarah and reciting Adhkar, people are still afflicted. Usually I would say that's because there's a presence of something on that site which has not been removed, such as some form of shirk, such as some buried uh, contracts of magic between the jinn and the magician or something like that and inshallah the, you know a person you know you make dua at the end of the day like I said there are many things you can't answer but a person does the most that they can for taqullah mastata'atum the person keep, the, the teachers keep on going to the madrasa with the right aqidah they are patient upon what befalls them and they do their absolute best and they trust upon Allah and be idnillah one day from the days inshallah Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will show them how to remove whatever is afflicting them bi idnillah tabarak wa ta'ala wallahu alam tafaddal ya Usually a person has no after effects if it's been completely removed. But if a person does find after effects, then I would recommend the person to recite Surah Al-Baqarah at least, you know, two or three times a week if they're able to do so. Just break it up into small chunks and recite it, inshallah. And just again, their adhkar, listening to Quran, especially if that makes them feel a bit more relaxed. And you find that the effects get less and less over time, inshallah. Wallahu alam. Tafadhali. I think it's, uh, how safe is it for someone to perform ruqya? I think it's as safe as any, um, as anything, you know, any kind of, you know, there is some degree of, I suppose there is some degree of, of danger involved, but a person trusts upon Allah, and you know, it's like a person who, like I said, the council worker that removes the wasp's nest, every now and again he's going to get stung. But in general, you know, like alhamdulillah, if he takes his precautions, bi'ithnillahi tabarak wa ta'ala, he'll be fine. And when you compare that, to the benefit of doing it, the benefit is absolutely huge. And of course, anything that a person suffers for the sake of Allah, bi idnillahi ta'ala, is, is with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and they'll be rewarded for it. Tafaddal ya. Wa alaykum salam wa rahmatullah. Mm. Okay, so a person who is, has, has um, kind of good days and bad days, good times and bad times, and where the jinn comes into them at particular times. In these cases, my experience is you recite when the jinn is there. It, you are, it, don't get me wrong, reciting at any time is going to be good for them. But it's far more effective if you recite when the jinn is there. Because sometimes you find people, they don't appear to be possessed all the way throughout the, the day. It seems to be particularly at Maghrib time or when the nightfall happens. And those people, inshallah, I find my experience is that when you recite on them at that time, it's more effective, inshallah. Okay, some people who are reciting Rukia and they feel that it's not making a, a difference. Uh, two advices to them. First of all, they should remember the ayah in Surah Al-Baqarah. 
when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala explains that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tests and tries a people until even the messenger and those who are with them say, Mata Nasrullah. When is the help of Allah coming? And Allah says, Ala inna Nasrullahi qareeb. Indeed, the help of Allah is very near. So you never, ever, ever despair. And you never, ever, ever stop. You continue and you be patient. Even if you are patient until the end of that person's life, you carry on. And the other thing that is beneficial is maybe that person needs to ask advice and, and help from people who are a little more experienced and maybe that will kind of be more effective because you don't know where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala puts the cure. And also for them to try other forms of cure like uh, hijama, like dates, like and so on. Just to, to vary things because you don't know where Allah has put the good. Go on. Sorry, no problem. You can recite on more than one person together. I've seen it done before, inshallah. But obviously it's more difficult to deal with because if they both go crazy at the same time, you're kind of fending two people off at the same time. It depends how violent they are. Sometimes when people are very violent, it's better to keep it to one person so you can control them a little bit. But alhamdulillah, you know, if someone's spending a whole hour reciting, that's a lot of time in the day. So, they, you know, maybe they need to join between both of those people. And don't forget that they make dua. So, you know, to hajjud and times like that, they make as much dua as possible. I think you need, you, you need, um, you need I, I think there's no harm whatsoever, despite what some people say, there's no harm in having a different number of ruqa and, and different people coming at different times, no harm at all. And sometimes this is the best way to do it. I know in a case that I had that was very, very, very bad, myself and another brother, I used to come in the evenings and he used to come in the mornings and the person themselves should also be cooperative if possible. That they themselves all throughout the day are making dua and all throughout the day are trying to recite as much as they're able and then you come in the evening and someone else comes in the morning. Alhamdulillah, it's, it's even better. And remember to make the house a place where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is obeyed and the more that's true, the, e the more it will make the place hateful for the shaitan inshaAllah. Wallahu tabarak wa ta'ala alam. تفضل يا اخي I mean to be honest I don't I I don't advise um this kind of like help over the phone type things but in terms of someone who's suffering and and people are taking a lot of money I advise him you know honestly is I'm sure that if he goes and I mean because I'm not from from Birmingham I would recommend definitely you speak to the Ka'ullah the Imam of the Masjid because he mashallah not only is mashallah very very uh, proficient reciter of the Quran himself but obviously I'm sure he knows brothers in the Masjid who are active um in terms of recommending people to do ruqya SubhanAllah, there's very, very few people who I trust or recommend. Um, although I do, uh, there is a brother whose name is Abu Zura, who is also very good. I think maybe perhaps he's based, he's not based in Birmingham though, he's based in, I think, uh, somewhere near Manchester. But there are very, very few brothers. Most of them, SubhanAllah, unfortunately, many of them are liars and many of them steal and devour the wealth of the people in falsehood. But we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for his safety. But you know, you go to the reliable people like the Imam of the Masjid, uh, like the people who are organizing the Masjid and involved in it, and inshallah ta'ala, you ask them and inshallah they will show you, or they themselves will be involved, or they themselves will show you inshallah somebody who is able to help to make it easier. Now there's nothing wrong with taking money for ruqya if it's necessary, but people should not be excessive as much as they're you know, able to. Fadl ya Okay. Uh, regarding your first question about non-Muslims, I see no reason why they can't give the evil eye. Obviously, you don't ask them to make wudu, but like I said, there are alternatives like, for example, 
you know, maybe perhaps something, you know, as close as you can get or whatever, you know, you're able to do or just simply performing rukia on the person until the, until the evil eye goes away, inshallah. Um, in terms of your second question, remind me, your third question, I remember, your third question regarding the people gathering together to perform rukia. Well, I don't know this to be from the sunnah. I, I hesitate to say it's completely, you know, wrong, but I would advise people to stick to, you know, what they know as much as possible and Allah knows best. What was your second question regarding? Okay, still water or running water, I don't think it makes, inshallah, any difference. The main thing is that you collect the, the remains of, you know, the, the wudu that they make, the, what they call fadl wudu, the, the water that remains from the wudu. That's the main thing that, that matters, inshallah. I'm um, trying to find some brothers who ask questions again. So, hold on. The person who is making the remark ideally should say Tabarakallah, MashaAllah, Tabarakallah. But if they you know, if you have to remind them, then this is part of Ta'awun al Birri wa Taqwa, cooperating upon good uh, and piety, inshallah. Last question, bin Allah Ta'ala. I mean, we can take questions after we finish up. Let the brothers go, and anyone who wants to stay around, I'll sit here for a while, inshallah. Well, I don't, I don't know any statistics um, uh, that uh, would say that a person is such and such percent of a chance, but it, it, I do find it, in my experience, to be more common that a person who's been afflicted once is sometimes susceptible to being afflicted again, unless Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has mercy on. Even if he prays his salah five times, I think it, it can sometimes leave a weakness in him, and Allah knows best, but that's just my experience, and Allah, Allah knows best. Okay, subhanakallahumma wa bihamdik. Shahadu an la ilaha illa anta astaghfiruka wa atubu ilayku. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.